Hello and welcome to Heterogeneous Integration using Organic Interposer Technology. Heterogeneous integration is being driven by the continuous growth in high-performance computing and artificial intelligence, or AI. With Moore's Law slowing for most applications, chips are running into size limits. For certain applications, such as networking, computing, and AI, designers want to build massive chips that exceed reticle size, making deconstruction of the chip into smaller than reticle sized chiplets the only option. The challenge is how we best serve this transition from Moore's Law to more than more, where there's more to it than reducing transistor sizes. Data speed is a critical part of this. We see that with extremely high certies moving from 56 gig to 112 gig. With photonics, we see people going from 200 gig to 400 gig. While photonics has been on the horizon for some time, it has mainly been used between various types of servers and storage in large data centers. Putting it into a package would have significant impact on performance, latency, and heat-related effects. But how quickly this can be introduced on a commercial scale at a competitive price point is unknown at this time. Hardware for AI training requires large bandwidth. 3D-based memory products coupled with new GPU and ASIC-based processors and better algorithms offer solutions here. Hardware for AI inference requires less bandwidth but low latency. Interposers could come as a solution because of the modularity and its capacity to integrate more than one chip. The integrated circuit or IC industry has moved from 7 nanometer and 5 nanometer to silicon nodes. However, wafer costs and design costs continue to increase exponentially, and power density is still increasing. Entire new product classes such as machine learning and deep neural networks are poised to dramatically alter technical innovation in every corner from molecular modeling of new vaccines to automated transportation paradigms for automotive travel and aircraft flight. The entire spectrum of new product innovations has one thing in common, an insatiable thirst for higher and higher compute performance with nearly unimaginable data access and data throughput expectations it is an exciting and challenging time in the semiconductor industry. As the cost of advanced node silicon have risen sharply with the 7 and 5 nanometer nodes, advanced packaging is coming to a crossroad where it will no longer fiscally be prudent to pack all of the desired functionality into a single die. While single die packages will still be around, the high-end market is shifting towards multiple die packages to reduce overall cost and improve functionality. This shift is not just to add local memory, such as the addition of high bandwidth memory or HBM modules to an application-specific integrated circuit or ASIC die, but also to separate what would have been a monolithic ASIC in prior generations to its constituent parts, such as the CPU cores, serial or deserializer or certes, and input-output or I.O. blocks. By splitting the monolithic die into smaller functional blocks, costs can be reduced through improved wafer yield on the smaller CPU cores and reusing older vetted intellectual property from a prior silicon node for the IO and CERTES that do not necessarily need to be the most advanced silicon node. The traditional approach to fine pitch multi die packaging has been silicon interposers with through silicon vias or TSVs. While the TSV approach has ushered in new performance and levels never seen before, one of the major limitations is the inability to scale with higher and higher frequencies. The maximum frequency that a silicon interposer can handle between die to die interconnects is approximately 4 GHz due to the parasites of the silicon. As die to die interconnects increase their bandwidth to higher and higher levels, the 4 to 6 GHz limitation can become a major bottleneck. Eliminating the silicon and silicon dioxide dielectrics and using polymers as the dielectric and in the interposer itself can solve this problem. For optimum performance in the high performance computing, the trend is to move the memory as close to the processor as possible through heterogeneous integration. Currently, there are two primary paths to achieve integration of heterogeneous die at the IC package level, flip chip BGA multi-chip modules, or MCMs, where the diverse die are integrated directly at the package substrate level, or integrating the different die at a module level and then attaching the module to the package substrate using module technologies such as 2.5D TSV or high density fanout integration such as Amcor Swift technology. The flip chip BGA MCM has been in production for decades and 2.5D TSV has been in production since 2012, while high density fanout or HTFO approaches have been available only recently. Amcor's Swift HGFO technology has distinct advantages over competing thin film organic fanout laminate substrate, and silicon-based interposer technologies, such as improved assembly yield associated with RDL first chip last assembly, or known good diode attached to known good RDL sites, 
the ability to pre-build the organic interposer, reducing cycle time by several weeks, flexibility and scalability in supporting heterogeneous multi-die, 3D, and system and package constructions, and dramatic electrical, mechanical, and thermal benefits due to the thin film RDL buildup and fine feature capabilities. This trend towards heterogeneous integration of different die, originating from different silicon process nodes, or even completely different substrate materials such as silicon carbide or gallium arsenide. Even functional subblocks of the system on chip or SOC require new IC packaging approaches. In the 2011 and 2012 timeframes, the first 2.5D TSV products were introduced, primarily to move DRAM closer to the compute function or to enable very large die to be broken up into subblocks for yield cost or performance considerations. The first discrete high speed long reach Certes IO chiplet devices became available three to four years ago. Now, product and IC architects have expanded to additional physical and electrical architectures, with the chiplets and die to dice interface requirements being quite varied, from short reach serialized interfaces to wide parallel interfaces. As seen on the left, a typical TSV interposer is roughly 100 microns thick and has two to four layers of copper traces, as seen on the top side between the micro bumps and the through silicon vias. The dielectric typically used in TSV interposers is silicon dioxide. On the right, there is an example of a substrate swift interposer. Depending on the desired dielectric thickness, copper trace thickness, and number of RDL layers, the overall thickness can vary between 20 and 40 microns. The dielectric used in substrate swift interposers is a polymer material with a lower dielectric constant than silicon dioxide, which improves electrical performance. Both interposer types can handle the fine pitch pumps of high bandwidth memory and other high speed die to die interfaces. The minimal module bump pitch is only limited to what the substrate can handle. For, for large body flip chip BGA packages, it's typically a 130 to 150 micron bump pitch. The high density fan out buildup process begins with a carrier. Commonly glass is used, but silicon and varying ceramics have also been evaluated. Glass carriers have the benefit of coming from many different suppliers and being configurable with different thermal expansion rates and different stiffnesses. The RDL buildup process can be as common as the standard bump redistribution layer found in wafer level CSP products to, to something that would be more commonly found in a laminate substrate factory. Same with the dielectrics that are used. It can be a spin on polymer found in bumping or a vacuum press layer found in substrate manufacturing. The buildup process repeats for each RDL layer until you come to the final micro bump pad to receive the die or chiplets. These final micro bump pads should have a metal stack or UBM that allows for an easily solderable surface for the micro bumps on the die. The chip attach process is then performed and then either capillary underfill or molded underfill is performed. If capillary underfill is used, then an overmold process is still required. Since the thermal requirements of most of these types of devices is high, the overmolding must be removed in a mold grind step to then reveal the silicon backside. After the silicon backside is exposed, the wafer is flipped and goes through a final wafer bumping process to plate the module bump. After the molded module wafer has been completed, it can be transferred to the standard flip chip BGA assembly line and treated like a standard wafer. The molded module wafer goes through wafer saw to simulate the modules. The modules then process through standard flip chip attach procedure. After flip chip attached, the module is underfilled. Most of these large body modules would then have a stiffener ring or lid attached. Finally, the package is laser marked and then the BGAs are attached. Mechanical simulation can be used as a tool to rapidly compare various geometries, components, and materials without the cost of purchasing and building physical parts. For this paper, we created a virtual test vehicle with no real world, world physical counterpart in SolidWorks and performed simulations in ANSYS Workbench Mechanical. The virtual test vehicle is based on other large body devices created for testing and includes six HPM along a large ASIC die on an interposer module. The objective of this simulation was to study the differences in warpage and stress between an Amcor substrate SWIFT package with an ASIC and multiple HBMs and an equivalent version of the same package with 2.5D TSV interposer. The module itself is shown here. It is quarter symmetric using temperature dependent linear elastic materials. The temperature applied to induce warpage and stress is the same everywhere within the model with the stress-free temperature set to a typical underfill cure and lid attached temperatures. Results are reported at room temperature and reflow temperature. 
The materials and substrates technicians chosen for this device were typical of large body packages with a 12 layer low CT thick core substrate. Note that these dimensions are arbitrary for this virtual test vehicle. A body, larger body size may be more appropriate for a module of this complexity, but would require more simulation time. The only qualities vary between the Substrate Swift and 2.5D models are the interposer thickness, interposer material, and trace material distribution within the interposer itself. Amport Technology has used simulations for several years to specifically test and evaluate Substrate Swift high density fan out structures and materials and compare Substrate Swift packaging with other technologies that serve at the high-end advanced packaging market. Shown on this slide are several examples of simulations where the model result matches well in both shape and magnitude with real-world examples. This prior ex experience is leveraged here for model validation. Equivalent material properties and boundary conditions that were used in these prior models are reused for the current 6HBM virtual test vehicle presented in this paper. Module warpage results for the 6HBM virtual test vehicle are pictured on this slide. The key result here is that substrate swift module warpages at reflow temperature is significantly reduced in this simulation versus an equivalent 2.5D model. Room temperature warpage is less critical at this step during assembly as long as warpage remains below the threshold for liable handling in the assembly line. Substrate swift and 2.5D modules seem to follow opposite warpage trends. 2.5D shows very low, almost flat room temperature warpage, but high reflow warpage, especially around the HBMs and module corners. The substrate swift interposer is warped at room temperature due to the CT mismatch between the silicon dye and RDL traces within the substrate swift layers, but this warpage is greatly reduced at reflow temperatures. At reflow, the substrate swift module shows about 40% less warpage than the 2.5D TSV module and the warpage seems more evenly distributed across the module versus being concentrated at the module edges near the HBM. Simulation was then done to evaluate warpage of the package prior to lid attach, immediately after module attach and underfilling. Results are reported here. Warpage in this case can be a good indicator of how much relative interaction there is between a die or module and substrate. For a given material set, for a lidless package, increased warpage implies increased internal forces and more stress between a die and the substrate. Substrate swift shows lower warpage prior to lid attach. In, this, in simulation, this is due more to flexible material properties within the substrate swift layers versus the rigid layer of silicon in 2.5D package. Here we show that the pre-lid attach warpage is reduced by about 11% with the substrate swift module. Package warpage results are reported on this slide. Warpage magnitude and shape are similar between the 2.5D package and the substrate swift package. Overall results for warpage at both room temperature and reflow temperature for this material set were approximately 20% higher for the substrate swift package, but were still within acceptable copolarity ranges. It is important to note that the material set for this package has had been optimized for 2.5D technology. It was not changed for the substrate swift version in comparison. Substrate swift designs typically have flatter module area warpage and may not require exceptionally low CT substrate materials to control package warpage. A significant driver of warpage for this specific simulation was the CT mismatch between the copper lid and the selected low CT substrate core material. Note that most warpage in the substrate swift device occurs outside the module area near the corner of this package. Stress within a few selected solder joints was also studied in the simulation. Copper pillar joints were introduced in two locations, under the ASIC corner, between the die and interposer, and at the module corner, between the interposer and substrate. Again, the only changes between the substrate swift model and the 2.5D model was the thickness and material of the interposer itself. Comparative results for stress at the corner ASIC joint between the die and interposer and the corner module joint between the interposer and substrate are reported on this slide, along with comparison of stress in the back end of line layers near the active surface of the ASIC. Von, von Mises stress was chosen for this comparison. While other stress metrics can be more precise in understanding what is happening in a model, the general von Mises stress metric is adequate for capturing trends at a high level. Error bars for the substrate swift models were created by increasing and decreasing the stiffness of the dielectric polymer within the model. The stress experienced by the joints and die surface is lower for the package with the substrate swift interposer. 
In simulations, the Substrate Swift Interposer is much more flexible and compliant than the equivalent 2.5D Interposer. This may allow the Substrate Swift layers to better absorb and distribute stresses between the dyes and the substrate. Electrical signaling in a typical package can be broken down generally into in-module signaling and off-module signaling, or off-package signaling. Typical examples for in-module signaling include memory data buses between processors or ASICs and discrete in package memory like HBM. Off-package signaling can range from high-speed long-reach SERDES for networking to PCIe Gen 4 high-speed buses for AI and server applications. Signaling between die and a substrate swift module can be serialized data streams with fewer physical wires, but higher data rate or parallel interfaces with more physical wires and slower individual wire data rates. Characterizing the high-speed channel is critical, and this has been done using S-parameter test structures and simulation matching. In addition to this, power delivery network is becoming even more important as transistor operating voltages have decreased. This plot shows the insertion loss for a four millimeter length of in-module signal routing between the ASIC and HBM or ASIC and other chiplets for SWIFT, RDL layers, and silicon interposers. At four gigahertz, the delta is over 1.5 dB. This is a huge difference considering a typical package budget is three dB. At higher frequencies, this delta really opens up, which is important for many chiplet die-to-die -die interfaces that are run from five gigahertz all the way up to 20 gigahertz. For off-package signaling, high-speed signals typically travel straight downward through the interposer. For Swift RDL, this is a combination RDL metal layers and vias between these layers with a total thickness of 34 to 50 microns. For a 2.5D interposer, the three silicon vias pass through approximately 100 microns of bulk silicon. Again, the Swift RDL stack shows a lower insertion loss. This is a key point as many of these off-package signals are some of the highest speed signaling approaches available, including 112 gig PAM4 long reach 30s, where even a 0.2 to 0.4 dB improvement in insertion loss can be the difference between a functioning correctly and not. In the time domain, the eye diagrams easily pick up this difference. Both plots are for 50 ohm terminations and data rates are four gigabits per second for both cases. The eye opening on the Substrate Swift RDL case is significantly more open at even just four gigabits per second. By way of an example, this Substrate Swift case shows an eye height of 0.67 millivolts compared to the 0.49 millivolts for the 2.5D silicon interposer case. To evaluate the reliability of the Substrate Swift package, a test vehicle was designed and fabricated with four layers of RDL and a daisy chain in a 67.5 by 67.5 package size, millimeter package size. The reliability tests were performed in accordance with the JEDEC standards, including moisture soak level four for preconditioning, temperature cycling condition G, and unbiased HAST at 110 degrees for 264 hours. The high temperature storage test was also evaluated at 150 degrees C for 100, 1,000 hours. Package integrity was monitored before and after reliability tests, as well as daisy chain connectivity by checking the resistance. Daisy chain resistance increases by 20% are considered as an electrical test fail. All samples pass the reliability tests. The cross-sectional images show the micro bump from end of line and post reliability tests. No solder joint reliability failures were found and all reliability tests were passed. Both in simulations and test vehicle results, Substrate Swift packaging has demonstrated excellent electrical and mechanical robustness. This robustness has also been demonstrated with large body test vehicles, largely by the reduction of in stress imparted on the die. The improved electrical performance will provide a reliable platform for die to die bus speeds well beyond that required by HBM2 and HBM2E. Enabling substrates of packaging to serve both the ASIC HBM configuration as well as the many and varied chiplet based constructions now in the marketplace and on the drawing board. Thank you.